now that we have foreshadowed the prophecies that might must have even been in the back of John's mind as he wrote Revelation and saw all this about the 70 times 70 years of which the last seven years would be called Daniel's 70th week and would include the times of trouble for the Jews a tribulation on earth more unbearable than anything that God had allowed to happen to man Daniel's revelation revealed the time John's revelation revealed what was to happen and last time we saw the statue a dream of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel's interpretation for him and for all Bible students throughout history until even now with us <laughs> so that we could truly see in advance what God had decreed for this world step by step how God would punish and destroy his enemies once and for all we saw on the statue the ten toes that would represent the last ten nations maybe simply those nations located around the Mediterranean Sea but a ten nation confederacy that would hand over all of their allegiance to Antichrist during the last part of Daniel's 70th week signaling the beginning of the wrath of God being poured and the overthrow of Satan's domain on earth described in John's revelation so now we can begin to study this revelation called the apocalypse we got your paper and pencils <laughs> I keep pounding this because it, it is so handy to have these little notes that you might take just little things you jot down when you're thinking about this later anyway the vision John received opens with instructions for him to write the seven churches he's to write to the seven churches when we when we first start in the book of Revelation he both commends them for their strength warns them about their flaws each letter was directed to a church that then existed but also speaks to conditions in the church throughout history it's, it's a stretch maybe but you can see where God is he is speaking to those those churches that existed at that time he already knew what was going to be in this world and as he speaks to them he's also speaking to us today we're going to find out that not much has changed but also speaks to conditions in the church throughout history it all also trickles down to our own personal lives we must constantly fight against the temptation to become loveless immoral lenient compromising and lukewarm about our faith we have to fight against these things not that they're going to keep us out of the kingdom but we need to we have a nature that will cause us to do that and we have to stand strong in our heart we can see very clearly here how the Lord feels about these qualities this is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to all those who listen to its words and then do what it says for me this teaching is better titled Pentateuch to Apocalypse so that's why I'm calling it and I have used this title before for good reason this revelation is the consummation of God's scheme of redemption for man it is presented systematically throughout the Bible in the early Genesis account which was the first of the five books of Moses called the Pentateuch God was was uh, declared to be the omnipotent creator of the universe worthy of praise for his majesty and power the created universe was wholly good until Satan introduced man to the evil of sin and its consequences because of man's sin man came to need redemption and reconciliation with God through his chosen nation of Israel God provided for that redemption the Old Testament records God's power of judgment which was made known through Moses the law and the prophets then the Gospels of the New Testament shows man's Redeemer come to earth in fulfillment of the law and prophecy Jesus Christ brought a new righteousness of faith 
faith having the power of salvation in dying on the cross and then being resurrected from the grave Jesus triumphed over Satan's power of death based upon that demonstration of his lordship and power the church was born and grew to swelling proportions and influence when the church was met with opposition and persecution the apostles and other inspired writers wrote down their various letters called epistles letters are epistles to encourage their fellow Christians to persevere in the prospect of their final redemption in the life to come so we still read those epistles and they still do the same things for us so this is why I see the book of Revelation as the final chapter of God's scheme of re redemption that began in the Pentateuch and now becomes the theme of this apocalypse of John in his last years perhaps around AD 95 through 96 the aging apostle is exiled on the Greek island of Patmos we're talking about John during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian he received through an angel a revelation from the Spirit of God in which he is directed to write what he sees and to send it to the seven churches in Asia all of the churches at this time are facing severe persecution and suffering because of their new faith in Christ the seven churches were located on a major Roman road one road that went up through Turkey arriving first at Ephesus he would travel then north to Smyrna and Pergamum then southeast to Thyatira and then continue on to Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea in the exact order in which the letters were dictated before we get to the chapters where the Lord is speaking to the churches we read first the prologue to this letter it's in Revelation 1 chapter 1 so we're beginning in Revelation if you got your book go to chapter 1 verse 1 it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ verse 3 blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near blessed are the ones who read the words of this prophecy we're reading the words right now we're blessed Revelation is the book about the future and about the present it offers future hope to all believers especially those who have suffered for their faith by proclaiming Christ's final victory or evil and the reality of eternal life with him it also gives present guidance as it teaches us about Jesus Christ and how we should live for him now through graphic pictures we learn that Jesus Christ is coming again evil will be judged and that the dead will be raised to judgment resulting in eternal life or eternal destruction the book of Revelation is ap apocalyptic meaning uncovered unveiled or revealed the style of ancient literature usually had spectacular and mysterious imagery John's vision includes many signs and symbols that convey the essence of what is to happen what John saw in most cases was indescribable so he used illustrations to show what it was like so when reading this symbolic language we don't have to understand every detail John himself didn't before we go any further we should look at seven rules regarding prophecy 
Number one, we should understand prophecy as history written beforehand. Prophecy written, history written beforehand. Two, then give the same meaning to words of prophecy as you do the words of history. Three, do not look for hidden meanings. Four, do not think that prophecy must be fulfilled before it can be understood. Five, do not interpret God's own interpretation of anything in prophecy. Six, take all prophecy literally unless it is clear that it cannot have a literal meaning. Then, give the truth conveyed by the figurative language. And finally, let the Bible be its own interpreter. When John says that the time is near, in verse 3, he is urging his readers to be ready at all times for the last judgment and the establishment of God's kingdom. We do not know when these events will occur, but we must always be prepared. They will happen quickly, and there will be no second chance to change sides. Jesus is portrayed as a all-powerful king, victorious in battle, glorious in peace. He's not just a humble, humble earthly teacher. He is the glorious God. As we read John's description of the vision, we must keep in mind that John's words are not just good advice. They are truth from the king of kings. These words are an amazing portrayal of the future. But we shouldn't just get caught up in the words. We should let the truth about Christ penetrate our lives. Let it deepen our faith in him and strengthen our commitment to follow him no matter what the cost. So let's go on. Revelation chapter 1 start, and going on in verse 5. Revelation 1 verse 5. <clears throat> it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn, or the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood. All, this, all of our sins. The firstborn from the dead. Just looking at, at this scripture is so great. The firstborn from the dead. That means that he didn't die. That he was resurrected. And that's what we're going to do. Because he's the first fruit. We're the ones that follow after him. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. Freed us from our sins. Quit hanging on to your sins. He's freed you by his blood. Verse 6. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. John says. And in verse 7. It says, look. He is glory and power. He is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are still left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This is describing what we believe is the rapture. All people will see him arrive, and they will know it is Jesus. In Mark 13, verse, 27, uh, verse 26, it says, At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and 
of power and glory. And when he comes, he will uh, conquer evil and judge all people according to their deeds. Let's go ahead in Revelation a little bit and to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. We're just going to jump ahead there. We're going to see this later on as we study Revelation. But let's just look up there because it relates to what we're saying here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and, the, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Verse 15, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This whole period be before Daniel's 70th week, before that seven years of, of tribulation begins, is the church age, as we said before. And this is where God is preparing all of us. Our names written in the book of life. God foreshadowed this in prophecy through Zechariah. Let's go all the way back in the Old Testament. See, we're using even more of the Bible now. Back to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, 10. It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. They're going to see this. Isn't that amazing that even in prophecy in the Old Testament, it's talking about Jesus being pierced. In verse 8, we see Alpha and Omega mentioned. These, of course, are the Greek words for the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The Lord is the beginning and end. God the Father is the eternal Lord and ruler of past, present, and future. The Old Testament again, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And Isaiah 48, chapter 48, the same book, Isaiah, verse 12. It says, listen to me, O Jacob, Israel, whom I have called, I am he. I am the first and the last, verse 13. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. Without God, you have nothing that is eternal, nothing that can change your life, nothing that can save you from sin. Is the Lord your reason for living? Can, can you really say that? Is the Lord your reason for living? Or is it other things that you do in your life? Not that you shouldn't do those things. You should do those things. God has given us gifts to be able to do all kinds of things. And they all glorify Him. When they're done properly, and if we seek God in everything we do, they will be done properly. There is no other way except to honor the one who is the beginning and the end of all existence wisdom and power, the Alpha and the Omega. Let's continue now in Revelation as we share John's vision of the Son of Man. It's Revelation chapter 1, still, starting in verse 9. 
I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are, that are, are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Samira, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned around, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head was, and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. Verse 15, his feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. In his, just remember that, in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Now we're going to see about the seven stars and the double-edged sword coming out of his mouth being the word of God. Patmos, where John received his revelation, was a small rocky island, as I told you, in the Aegean Sea, about 50 miles offshore from the city of Ephesus. So he's only about 50, feet, 50 miles offshore from Ephesus, and that's going to be the first church, remember? John was exiled to Patmos because he refused to stop preaching the good news. <laughs> Funny. At that time, there was extreme persecution of Christians. In our day, in which we live, in our freedom, few of us have the courage to share God's word with others. <clears throat> if we hesitate to share our faith during the easy times, how will we then do during times of persecution? The seven golden, gold lampstands that we talked about are the seven churches in Asia. See, I told you what those seven, the lampstands were the seven churches in Asia, which is now Turkey. I talked to people on the internet from Turkey, and it's hard to find a Christian. They're all Muslim. They're all Islamic there. And Jesus stands among them. Jesus stands among the churches today. When a church faces persecution, it's to remember Christ's deep love and compassion, the same as he had for the seven churches in Asia. When a church is troubled by internal strife and conflict, it should remember Christ's concern for purity and his intolerance of sin. Sin means missing the mark. If a church is set out to do something, and they don't do it, they've missed the mark. The Son of Man is Jesus himself. The title Son of Man occurs many times in the New Testament in reference to Jesus as the Messiah. His white hair indicates his wisdom and divine nature. His bright eyes symbolize judgment of all evil. The gold sash across his chest reveals him as the high priest who goes into God's presence to obtain forgiveness of sin for those who have believed in him. The sword in Jesus' mouth symbolizes the power and force of his message. His words of judgment are as sharp as swords. Let's read Isaiah 49, chapter 49, verse 2. It says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. In Hebrews, in the New Testament, chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
Continuing now in Revelation chapter 1, we're going to verse 17. <clears throat> Revelation 1, 17, we're almost through here. This is a long one, right? But this is the introduction. I want to get it down good to the book of Revelation. We're already up to verse 17. It says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen. What is now and what will take place later. Just stopping there for a minute. Just in the beginning of Revelation, it's talking about the church today. And right after that, then it starts talking about what's going to happen. Verse 20, chapter 1. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand. Remember, I told you to remember about that. And the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The angels, angelos, the messengers of the seven churches. Each of the churches today have the same. Our sins have convicted and sentenced us. But Jesus told, holds the key of death and the grave. And he alone can free us from eternal bondage to Satan. He alone has the power and authority to set us free from sin's control. Believers do not have to fear death or the grave because Christ holds the keys to both. What we have to do is turn from sin and turn to him in faith. When we try to control our life and, and disregard God, we set up a course that leads directly to hell. But when we place our life in Christ's hands, he restores us now and resurrects us later to an eternal, peaceful relationship with him. Finally, in verse 20, we see it referring back to lampstands and stars. Who are the angels of the seven churches? Do you remember? We know that angels in Greek is angelos, meaning messenger. It is used of men all through the book of Revelation. So we believe angels to mean the pastors of the seven churches. Those who would be the messengers for the churches. Even today, God speaks to the churches through his pastors. We can draw our own conclusions as to what is to be learned from the letters to the seven churches. But however you decide to look at them, the safest stand is to consider all the letters to apply to all of our churches today so that the individual in any church in any generation may be warned and profit by the failures of the first seven churches. These last four teachings serve as an introduction to a special Bible class and it's entitled Pentateuch to Apocalypse. Next time we're going to see the first church called Ephesus. Let's pray.